Thank you. Hello, everyone. How are you doing? Another week here uh, at School of the East. Hopefully, you remember the name of your class, right? Do you? I have to look at my paperwork here. Oh, it's uh, creative writing. Don't forget, it's also uh, intersected with some poetry. So today's lecture is for Monday, the 14th of November. And just to let you know, the topic today in creative writing is a screenplay for all you people who want to write uh, your, it's not a novel, but it's a screenplay for movies and TV shows. And then we have poetic language, how to use language and poetry to improve your poetry. Okay, so without further ado, we go through my process here, I do every week, go to the material, let me minimize myself. Looks like just some kind of glitch right there, but I'll take care of it. Okay, I minimize them out of the way. You don't need to see me. Start the slideshow. Go from the beginning. Looking good so far. So again, creative writing. If you need to know the acronym ENG102, I mean school code. Week six. Did I say that? Okay. You ready? Okay. Here we go. Uh, chapter six, the screenplay. Many authors with a good story to tell sometimes choose to tell it not only with words, but also with pictures, moving pictures. So you know what that means, TV or movies. Writing for the movies can be an exciting way to express your ideas. In the ultimate in the fiction writing principle of showing, rather than telling, and you'll make more money too if you write screenplays for movies, wow. Uh, writing for the movies. How do you know if the screenplay is the right format for presenting your story, right? Or should you be a novelist? Should you write a short story? Should you write a children's book? How do you know, okay? One way to think about this question obviously, is to ask yourself if you enjoy writing dialogue. And if you do, then the screenplay is for you, I think, right? True, you need interesting characters and plot. And some people are very good at writing very interesting characters and plot or storyline. But dialogue is the most important for the screenplay. Especially if you are writing a movie that you know is unlikely to have a large budget for special effects. Right? So, I mean, they don't have a lot of money to spend for like a superhero. The action can take place in the dialogue in those kinds of movies. Dialogue makes the movie interesting. It moves the action of the screenplay forward and fleshes out or brings out the characters. Uh, screenwriters must remember as they write that their script will be seen and heard, not read by their audience, right? Because they're watching it and they're listening to it. They don't have your screenplay in their hands at the movie theater reading the screenplay. They're listening to it. So it better be very good, very high level dialogue. Another point to consider is if your story is very cere cerebral, which means a thinking man's story. If the plot involves characters who do a lot of thinking and a little talking, but don't get involved in much action, that would not be good to watch. You see a man standing there and then he's thinking, what, what kind of action or involvement with dialogue are you doing? That's better to be put in a paper. Every screenplay doesn't need a hold on to your seat car chase or a battle scene or a baby being born. But it does need some movement and some points of visual interest. In other words, some interesting things to see right? for the eye. The novel might be a better choice for an inner directed plot. And the short story or the short movie, the right pick for an idea with a smaller scope or range, as they say. And 
continuing at the top. One other thing to think about is whether you feel you're a visual person. That's another important aspect. Novelists, of course, need to describe their scenes and characters to make them come alive in readers' imaginations. But they don't need to structure their story so that it lends itself to visual presentation. Correct. Everything about a screenplay is connected to an audience watching it. So screenwriters must be comfortable with both words and pictures. In essence, the screenplay's form and the way it's written differ completely from a novel's because the screenplay is focused on being made into a movie, which I talked about earlier. For the people who want to write a movie, that's for you. Screenplay versus novel. Like the novel, a screenplay is based on theme, characters, plot, setting, and dialogue, which those are the answers to questions in our last homework. It also requires gripping conflict. So gripping means something that gets a hold of you and won't let go, and then conflict is tension or a battle between two people, and then pacing, which is how long it takes. That doesn't lie down on the job, which means you don't have lazy pacing and a lazy conflict, like, oh, look over there across the street, maybe the police are going to arrest somebody versus the police maybe actually chasing somebody and the bad guy pulls a knife and the police have to confront them. So that's more gripping and the pacing is uh, moving forward with action. So here we go with a little snippet here. A conflict is made up of a series of crises. Strain points in the conflict that cause a realignment of forces or some change in the character. The plot is created by the selection and ordering of these crises. In each scene's internal crisis, an action is taken or not taken, or a decision is made or not made knowingly by the characters. This is said by Erwin R. Blacker, screenwriter, teacher, novelist, and television documentary writer. So this person has a lot of experience and a high level. So he knows what he's uh, talking about. The format of a screenplay is completely different from that of a novel. So please remember that. Don't say it's the same. Maybe I'll try to trick you on the final exam with a question like that. You know. Is the format of a screenplay uh, completely the same as a novel? No. It is structured in three acts and generally runs between 110 and uh, 120 pages. That's because scripts fewer than 100 pages or over 120 are less likely to be bought and produced due to economic reasons. So those are some magic numbers there, minimum, maximum, don't forget. Shorter films, which run closer to an hour and a half than two hours, are sometimes shunned or ignored by moviegoers who think they won't get their money's worth. Longer scripts can require an enormous, a ginormous budget to film, making them less attractive to production studios, no matter how good the story. If you hope to have your script end up being shown at the Cineplex, you uh, be well advised to keep it to the feature length standard of 100, which is one hour, well, a little lower, to 120 pages. All right, these are safety rules. So here's a little factoid. Uh, did you know that one of the reasons most movies run two hours or less, usually they run 90 minutes, an hour and a half, is so that they can be shown in theaters many times a day. Long movies can't be shown as often, lowering the theater's revenues or money that they make. See, everything's about money. And uh, I'll tell you something else that I didn't know. Uh, like you go to the Cineplex, and it doesn't matter how many movies they have showing there and how many people are seeing all these different movies, do you know that they make more money 
from the snack bar, snack bar, selling popcorn, candy, soda, and whatever they sell each day than the tickets they sell. I, it's unbelievable. Okay, so continuing here in the middle, another big difference between the novel and the screenplay is that the author provides a line of information at the beginning of each scene. This information called the slug line, okay? not to be confused with the slug that's in your grass, tells the reader about the look, time, and setup of the scene. Okay. Lines of description um, about what's happening in each scene are also provided. And uh, making a completed screenplay, a blueprint for filming a movie, as well as a vehicle for telling a story. Okay. Interesting stuff. Now we get to the three acts. Most screenplays are built around the framework of three acts. Act one is the generally a chap a quarter of the script. That's how much a percent, a quarter of the script. Act two is usually half, 50%. And act three is the final quarter, so 25%. So for a 120 page script, the first 30 or so pages will comprise act one. The next 60, act two, and the last 30 pages, act three. The most important part of the screenplay is the beginning. The first 10 pages of act one. They must dazzle. If you don't know the word dazzle, it's, uh, how can I say? Something dazzling is bright shiny so this must be it's kind of like saying they must be fantastic right so attention grabbing so exciting that they dazzle the people's eyes audience they must immediately grab the readers and later the viewers attention right it's a screenplay they must also do a lot of legwork which means a lot of like paperwork writing introduce the main character establish a story setting let readers know the type of movie they'll be watching comedy thriller science fiction western so i guess if temujin was in it it would be a thriller and then it gets the story going remember like i said earlier you got to keep going forward you got to get it moving if you've seen the beautifully photographed film out of Africa, you'll remember that the main character begins the story with the line, I had a farm in Africa. The viewers immediately see as the setting shifts from a woman sitting at a writing table to a hunting scene from her youth that the story will be a remembrance or memory and from the close and lush or beautiful scenery and the music and the introduction of a flirting male character, that this will be a story of relationships in a distant time and place. Another little factoid uh, right here. Each page of a screenplay is equal to approximately one minute of screen time. Boy, they're really dissecting this now. It means a standard length script of 120 pages will become a movie that's about two hours long. Wow. They're really crunching the numbers here. Okay, so at the bottom we have approximately 20 to 30 pages into most scripts. That's the first 20 to 30. A plot point is introduced. Remember, that's the storyline. This is an event that occurs within the story that sends its characters off in a new direction. You know, maybe it's about young people and the story starts and they're in high school and then they graduate high school and they go off to 
different colleges around the country, right? That's the new direction. And out of Africa, the female lead who hasn't married and is feeling condemned to a small life in the place where she was born, arranges a marriage to a friend and the two leave their homes in Denmark to start a life together in Africa. So see, there you go. Break away from, uh, excuse me, the countryside in Denmark and go to start a new and exciting life in Africa. Following the first flat point, Act two turns up the tension, right? Because what do you expect in Africa? What's going to go on? You don't know anybody, a different country, different language. During act two, the characters confront and deal with many issues and the conflict increases. And out of Africa, the lead characters fall in love. War causes change. A business fails and the lovers find that they can't live happily together. That's sad. I hope that doesn't happen to some of my students. Like Tall, I hope Tall has a happy, you know, future with her. Well, honey. Approximately three quarters of the way through most scripts, major issues come to a head, which means they're out in the open now. And in the second plot point, the climax, which is the ending, where another unexpected shift takes place. In out of Africa, the main characters sadly decide to go their separate ways. The male lead is killed in a plane crash. See, that's even worse. Like I was saying, I was hope for you guys to have a happy love life here. So these two, again, it's decided they can't live together. So they have to separate. So both have broken hearts. And then on top of it, another uh, unexpected shift. The man dies in a plane crash. So got to be ready for those things. For the last quarter of the script in Act 3, the denouement or resolution takes place. In these pages, any remaining issues are worked out and wrapped up, kind of like a summary, right, in your other writings. In Out of Africa, the female lead then returns to Denmark and begins to write about her experiences, bringing the story of the screenplay full circle or to a completion, right? Scene elements. A screenplay generally contains dozens of separate scenes that are put in a particular order to best tell the story. Each scene is usually short from a few lines of description and dialogue to four or five pages long and focuses on a particular incident. One scene should flow smoothly and clearly to the next and end with the words cut to, to indicate a jump to the following scene or fade out. Each scene is also marked with a slug line, their slug line again, providing information about the setting and time and with a few lines of Description about what's occurring in the scene. To see a sample scene from a screenplay, refer to Appendix A. So every scene has a lot of work to do. It should, right? Every scene should. Here we go. Move the story forward. We've, we've been repeating that. Move the main character closer to or further away from the goal. So uh, further away would be the breakup, right? Have a beginning, a middle, and an end. So any story needs those three points. Be a logical and necessary part of the story. Nothing crazy, nothing, you know, if the story's about two baseball players and their dream of making it to the major leagues from college, you can't start taking the screenplay into, well, they decided to go on vacation in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, and we're gonna start dedicating the screenplay to all their partying over there. That's not a necessary part of the story. Show how the characters involved feel, it's important. 
be compelling. Again, compelling means it makes you want to listen or watch. Contain either conflict or the foreshadowing of it, which means predicting. Or show an unexpected alliance or connection between opponents. Keep viewers eager to learn what happens next. Okay. Exposition. Exposition is the telling and the showing of the story. In classical tragedies, expositions was handled through the Greek chorus, a group of onstage performers who acted as commentators on the action. But today in movies, exposition is carried out in several ways. Through dialogue between the characters, through a narrator speaking all the time, first person, through words shown on the screen, San Francisco, 1936. You've seen that in the movies. The movie starts and then it, it says something like that, Tokyo, 1972. So that's, you know, through music and songs, through dramatic action. If a sleazy looking guy is walking slowly along the edge of a playground full of children, we know something bad is about to happen. The best kind of exposition isn't accomplished by factual statements, but by subtly yet dramatically integrated uh, details. Listen to that. That's a cool thing. Right? All right, so we have another factoid there. Says in Hollywood, the story gets you in the door. That means the producers will buy it, or the, the studio, sorry. The first question a producer asks is not whom the movie's about, but what it's about. Kind of like don't care in the beginning who, it, who it's about, but what is the story about? A compelling story gets you into the room. Strong characters keep you there. Yeah, yeah. Some exciting concept, and they go, that sounds great. Okay, how does the story go? And then your characters are weak. They're going to tell you to go. Without a strong story to guide them, your characters, though they may be fully developed, will wander or get lost aimlessly around until the producer yawns and thanks you for your time. Okay, and that's put forward by Christopher Keene, a novelist and screenwriter. It is most often characters who tell us who they are and uh, what's going on, but they don't generally just turn to the camera and stop the flow of action, although some comedies do use sparingly the technique of a character speaking directly to an audience. Characters perform exposition by giving us information through their interactions with their environment and other characters. For example, a woman might have a dialogue-free scene in which she forwards the plot by carefully putting on makeup in front of a mirror and then casually tucking a pistol into her purse. Or a frustrated woman might argue with a child, revealing deep-seated anger for her mother. Or a man might have a best friend with whom he has a drink every Friday after work, someone who's known him for a long time and draws out every juicy bit about his life. Good character-driven exposition tells us everything we need to know in bite-sized pieces, meaning small pieces. And with a delicate hand instead of a hammer's blow. You, you know, what they mean that is like if somebody like pounds some kind of point into you, like using a hammer, you're not going to want to continue, right? Has to be small bits. Well, again, I've used this before, it's the, it's the famous technique in horror movies. They never show you what the monster or the alien looks like in the beginning of the movie. That that kills the suspense, right? It just kills it. So they got to show you bits and pieces, a foot, a hand, a piece of slime, a shadow. And then they show you more and more until the movie's almost over. And then you get to see the full alien and people get to get scared. Okay, Same kind of technique. Ah, so that means we finished 
uh, the screenplay information. Now we're on to the to the poetry, mon ami. Yes, indeed, we go to the poetry of Trejoli for the Jean Phil and the Fenetre. Okay. Um, so we have poetic language. Words like families and nations have rich histories that can be traced through written records. Words have meanings that you encounter every day and others that lurk or kind of like hiding or moving around only in dictionaries. Many of these meanings can be used to create figures of speech that add texture or a certain thickness to your poetry. You don't want thin, weak poetry. You can also shift these words around to create special effects and leave a lasting impression on your readers. Definitions. While chatting, well, British people say chatting, American people say talking. While chatting with a friend about the weather or any such thing, the LA Rams, right, or the Dodgers, you might mention that the sky is blue. However, you will probably not acknowledge that the word blue may have more than one meaning. In fact, the word blue, and many other words for that matter, have two sets of meanings. One called denotative, which refers to the literal original meaning of the word, its dictionary meaning. The other set called connotative refers to the informal or slang meanings that a word has picked up throughout its life, right? And you have to be careful, excuse me, when using those. Um, for example, uh, here, I'll give you the literal. I saw a place the other day and it was called Wiz Pizza, W-H-I-Z-Z. -Z. If you don't know that word, uh, it means someone who is very good at something, very smart. They are a whiz, like the person, oh, he's a whiz at uh, mathematics, or he's a whiz at uh, basketball. Okay, So that's great. Older people know what that is. So I guess they're trying to be funny and say, we're, you know, we're very, very smart and good at making pizzas, right? So I guess you can call your restaurant or fast food place with pizza. But for young people, kids and teenagers, uh, whiz is used as a slang word, okay, a den denotative or denotative, and it means to go beep. -beep. So maybe some people in their 20s say, why do I want to go to this whiz place if they make beep, -beep in the pizza? So Gotta be careful how you use these things and think of both ways, okay? Denotation in a good dictionary such as Merriam-Webster's or American Heritage, you will probably see blue listed as a noun. Its primary definition related to a particular color of a certain electromagnetic wavelength. That's a lot of gobbledygook there. This definition would be considered the denotative meaning this meaning may seem ordinary. Most of those kinds of denotative meanings are, but it plays an important role in your language as do the denotative meanings of all English words. You have an effect, the most comprehensive dictionary of the English language is the Oxford English Dictionary or OED. The vast multi-volume record took decades to compile or put together and contains a definition for every word used since AD, after death, 1000. If you love words, the OED is your dream. There's only one catch. It costs hundreds of dollars. Do you want to spend that amount on a dictionary? Hmm. 
In addition to giving you the denotative definitions of words, a good dictionary will also tell you the history of a word. For example, the word tawdry arose or came forth from the name of Saint Audrey. The word originally described a fine lace necklace, but because the quality of the lace declined or went down for the years, eventually the word came to mean any cheap or shameful object. That's quite a change for a word originally associated with a saint. Yes, indeed. I, I can tell you one. This is very interesting. You might not like it either. I had some older man tell me years ago, again, the beginning of words. So he asked me, you know, I think it was in high school, so five years ago. So you know where the word hospital comes from? I have no idea. You know, I read the sports page. I worry about the Lakers, you know. So he says, well, originally in Europe, England specifically, uh, the medical system and hospitals were not the best, didn't have the best medicine or the best care or the best hygiene and cleanliness. And at that time, a lot of people got certain diseases and they had a spittoon. I don't know if you know what that is. You might have seen it in a book or a movie, but uh, just imagine like a metal bucket. It's usually brass. So it's not really a bucket, but it looks like a bucket. Okay. And it's metal and brass is uh, kind of a brownish, light brownish color. So in every hospital, for every patient, they supplied them with one of these. Why? Because a lot of the sicknesses that they had at the time, they had to spit a lot. So they would spit in the metal buckets all day. And I guess the nurses would take them out and clean them at the end of the day. But that's where, I guess they were not calling hospitals hospitals at the time, but they were called houses of spit toll and then it got formulated into house of spittle to hospital so I thought that was very interesting right same thing here with the tawdry now we move on to connotation the dictionary will also list a series of meanings that a word has acquired since its inception beginning or birth these meanings are the words connotations when words have several connotations, a person must rely upon its context to derive its meanings. Take a look at some of the connotations that the word blue has gathered. First, blue refers to color, right, the noun. There are also dress blues, a term referring to a military uniform. Blue can also mean depressed, I'm feeling blue, sad, or melancholy. And from the connotation comes the blues, the musical genre, which is songs about usually sad love life or sad life in general. It also appears in the common expressions blue in the face and out of the blue, which is a shocking surprise. Out of the blue. My ex-girlfriend showed up at Disneyland where I was waiting in line for the Matterhorn and I didn't know what to do when I saw her. Okay. As you can see, this one small word has quite a lot of meaning packed into it, blue. Many other words carry a list of connotative meanings just as long. As a poet, you, a student, you should do your best to learn as many connotative meanings as possible. Although you want to avoid the whiz pizza situation. Using words with several meanings in your poetry can broaden the scope of your work and can also help you reach a more diverse population of readers. Now we move on to word choice, the words that you choose to use and why. When you're searching for a synonym, 
what book do you pick up? Chances are you reach for a thesaurus, not a dinosaurus, but a thesaurus. A thesaurus offers synonyms and antonyms for every word you can find in the dictionary. In fact, the English language includes numerous words that mean virtually the same thing. Isn't that a bit repetitive, someone might ask? Not for a poet. And we're learning about poetry here. Each and every word has a slightly different pattern of sound and shape and of meaning that will create a certain individual effect on your reader. As a result, you have the power of word choice at your disposal. The sound of a word can be very important to the mood you are establishing in a poem. I'll say that again. The sound of a word can be very important to the mood you are establishing in a poem. Hint, hint. For example, compare these two separate stanzas. The old man wrenched his sack of guts. Okay, that's one. And hacked a cough. Yeah. The other one, the senior detected a murmur in his intestines. Right. Difference because of the word choices. You should be able to hear how the hard sounds of the first stanza, remember? <laughs> A cough with the softer sounds of murmur in his intestines in the second stanza. The sounds also affect the meaning and the melody of each line. The old man of the first stanza seems to be in a much worse state than the senior of the second example. The words hack and cough echo the hard sounds of the man's coughing. While the words murmur and intestines in the second example reduce the senior's illness to just minor discomfort, like, oh, give me the Pepto Bismol, versus the other one where it's, does this guy have throat cancer? What's going on here? Choosing words for a poem is usually a case of trial and error. You may try anywhere from three to 30 words for one particular spot. The trick is not to give up until you found the perfect word for the poem. Consult your dictionary, your thesaurus, and even your friends if you're having trouble coming up with the right word to complete a rhyme or in a stanza. Important choices. Now, word order. Well, choosing the words, you've chosen the words up here. Now, how are you going to place them? in what kind of order. So while choosing the words for your poems, you will also have to do, 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 determine in, in which order they appear. This choice may seem obvious, right? Oh, I know where to do that, A before B and C before D. You simply put the words together to make sentences, right? Wrong. Organizing the words in a poem is a delicate, delicate process that requires much thought and patience. The precise or exact placement of words in your poems will have a great effect on their combined meaning. For example, here are two sentences that contain exactly the same words. I nearly lost $100. I lost nearly $100. Which event would you rather experience? Most likely you would prefer the first event. Though only one word changes the position, the meanings of these two store sentences are quite different. The first sentence says that you did not lose any money, right? I nearly lost it, but I didn't lose. I Someone helped me at the end. However, the second says that you definitely lost something, right? I lost nearly 100, so something close, 87, 92, or even $99, right? So 
you say, I'd rather experience the first one, obviously. English speakers are approximately seven, or I'm sorry, use approximately seven patterns to create clauses. The most common of these patterns is noun, verb, noun. Sentences such as Sarah hits the ball and Sarah is a mother follow this order. Uh, for practice, think of some other examples that fit this pattern. More so than many other languages, English depends on word order to make meaning clear. For example, the order of the words in the sentence, the cat ate the mouse, tells us something different from the order, the mouse ate the cat. Because word order is so important in the language, English has a set series of patterns for phrase and clause construction. Whenever the basic patterns are changed, however, you must recognize the difference and determine the meaning. For example, if you read Sarah, the ball hits, or Sarah, a mother is, you can probably figure out that Sarah is the subject in both cases. But you would wonder why the ball and a mother have been moved. In poetry, moving words in this way can improve a piece. Rearranging words in a unique way can give your poem a stronger meaning or rhythm. Some examples of altered word order can be seen in Robert Browning's Soliquily of the Spanish Cloister, reappear in the fifth stanza of the poem. And here we go with some poetry. Okay. I'm going to try to do my best here. When he finishes refection, knife and fork he never lays. Ross Wise, to my recollection, as I do in Jesus' praise, I the Trinity illustrate, drinking watered orange pulp, in three sips the Aryan frustrate, while he drains his at one gulp. Okay, good luck. Browning alters the normal clause pattern when he writes knife and fork he never lays, Ross Wise. I, the Trinity, illustrate, and in three sips, the Aryan frustrate. In the common word order pattern, the first clause would read, he never lays knife and fork crosswise. The second would read, I illustrate the Trinity. And the third would read, frustrate the Aryan in three sips. But what has Browning gained by altering the pattern? The first and most obvious improvement is that every other line makes a rhyme. Okay? So he's, his goal is rhyming. By altering the word order, he can rhyme lays with praise and illustrate with frustrate. So this uh, kind of reminds me of like when you watch the... Star Wars movie. And in those movies, when the little guy comes out, what's his name? Yoda. He speaks this way. You know, he doesn't say, we must attack them. He says, attack them. We must. Right. He speaks in this kind of backward way. So the word order is being played with there, just as it is here in these examples. So just try to remember of Yoda. Now we move on to figures of speech. You also have at your disposal, on your use, tools called figures of speech, also known as tropes or conceits. I'll give you, you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> Am I tricking you though? I don't know. These figures will add depth to the meaning of your poems 
and add originality to the images you summon or bring forth or try to use. You are probably already familiar with the two most common figures, the metaphor and the simile, but many others can help you as well. Again, Corbett and Connor's book, Style and Statement, has a thorough list of these figures. Here is just a sample from the list. Metaphor, a comparison in which one word or phrase that normally designates one thing is used to designate another, right? Simile, a comparison using the word like or as. He is just like his father, right? Or he is, a, she is as smart as her mother. Okay. Synedochi, a reference to something by naming one of its parts. And you only have to do one. Uh, metonymy, a reference to something by naming a closely related object. Pun, a play on words. Okay, onomatopoeia, words that sound like what they mean. Paradox, two statements that can seem contradictory, but may actually be true, right? Here are some examples of these figures. Is my page going to move? There we go. Metaphor. My mother is a saint. So they're both interchangeable. Saint and mother. Similarly, my mother is as giving as a saint. Sinidochi. All hands on deck and do it right now on the ship. You're in the Navy. Metonymy. He always pays with plastic. Pun, the price of shingles is going through the roof. That's funny. Shingles are what you put on your house to make the roof. I guess, you know, you're, you have some holes up there and the rain's coming through, so you have to buy shingles. And then they're using a, a slang term, going through the roof, which means the price is raising too high. But he has to fix the roof, so that's what's funny, right? The price of shingles is going through the roof. Onomatopoeia, the only sound was the twitter of a bird. Tweet, tweet, tweet. Okay. Next paradox. The silence was so loud, it hurt my ears. Okay. So that's the paradox, which uh, think of a paradox as something that's kind of hard to understand, like, one thing cancels out another. Like people say, oh, I'm just, I, I, I need to have silence. I, I work in the city. It's so busy. It's so noisy. I need to have silence. So they go someplace in the countryside. They finally get silence. They're out there in the trees. And then they say, after so many hours, the silence was so loud. It hurt my ears. Which, I mean, it didn't really hurt their ears, but what it means is they couldn't handle it. It was so boring that they were just going crazy, right? But again, they're trying to state a paradox. As beneficial as good figures of speech may be, you must be careful not to overuse these tools, right? So keep on worrying about When a writer overuses figures of speech and other methods of repetition, it often takes away from the substance or meaning uh, of the work. One common problem occurs or happens when writers rely on cliches. Remember, they're called cliches for a reason. So don't beat a dead horse. Use repetition widely. So you, you can look at cliches 
Euh... I can't think of the other word in English now. Can you believe that? I'm losing my English. But you, yeah, here we go. You can think of cliches almost like a stereotype, you know. Uh, Mexican people are always going to want a burrito, which is not always the case, but it's a cliche, right? I get Japanese students here and they say, you know, American people eat hamburgers every day, which is not always the case. It's a cliche. It's a stereotype. So think of it like that, but don't use them too much. That's why they say, don't beat a dead horse, which is an old cliche. If the horse is dead, why are you still going to beat it, right? It's no use now. So use any type of repetition wisely. That's the point they're trying to put across here. And then the object of his frustration found in these contrasts. Okay, so I got to read some more. Let me see. Wait a minute here. Yeah, okay, I guess so. Okay, here we go. We stood by a pond that winter day, and the sun was white as though chidden of God. And a few leaves lay on the starving sod. They had fallen from an ash and were gray. Your eyes on me were as eyes that roll over tedious riddles of years ago. And some words played between us to and fro and which lost the more by our love. The smile on your mouth was the deadest thing, alive enough to have strength to die. And a grin of bitterness swept thereby like an ominous bird a wing. Since then, in lessons that love deceived and rings with wrong have shaped to me. Your face and the God-cursed sun, and a tree, and a pond edged with grayish leaves, okay? Rough stuff there, even for me, but they're trying to, they're trying to show there's many different techniques that we just talked about used within these stanzas. So the first contrast is found in stanza one, okay? A frozen pond and a sun, okay? White, it appears to be chastised or, you know, chastises, criticized by God. The speaker also notes a few scattered leaves on the starving sod, sod being the grass. They have fallen from a dormant ash, so a dead ash. Here the landscape mirrors the weary love between the speaker and the woman, so it's a tired love. He, like the sod, is starving for affection but neither the woman nor the son will nourish anything. She's being very dry. She's not going to give any affection. Ironically, from this point on in the poem, the we, a collective unifying pronoun, is separated, which the metaphor for the man and woman separation. In stanza two, the woman's eyes, rather than focusing on her love, rove, which means move around. So... You know, I hate to say it, but any of you guys that have had girlfriends before and they broke up with you, um, at the end of the relationship, you might have noticed that they were looking at every handsome guy that walked by. So that's what they're saying. Forget the notion, I only have eyes for you. Forget it. The dialogue is not an expression of desire or affection, but a tedious riddle that weakens their love further. So I'm trying to say... Is that really true? Is that something that people just say? Does it make you tired in a relationship to have to uphold that kind of standard? The eyes and the lips, therefore, betray a love gone wrong. So some kind of problem happened or they just got tired of each other. In stanzas three and four, contrast underscores the death of love. In stanza three, the smile is the deadest thing alive. What a strange comment. The grin shows bitterness and foreshadows or predicts the end of their relationship. In the last stanza, love has not made the speaker happy. Instead, love deceives or tricks you. And nature, which is usually a restorative force, 
holds all the dead ends and wrong that have shaped his memories. So pretty deep meaning there. Okay, interesting stuff. But obviously you're a beginning poet so you, or screenplay writer in the past. You don't have to go at this level. Okay. So now we will go on to the questions. Back to creative writing. The screenplay, our first question. What do you ask yourself if you think screenplay writing is for you? This question is important to let you decide what kind of a writer you are. Okay? Pretty straightforward. Two, a screenplay is based on the same things as a novel, but it also requires what things. There's a couple of the things it requires. Three, list the amount of each act of the screenplay to make up the framework. So I'll give you a hint. If you go back, there's three acts of. So what is the amount or percent of each that make up the framework? That's a little too much knowledge, but I know there'll be someone, what do you mean act of? Who's acting? It's never stated in the material that you gave us. I, so I give you enough hints, you can find it. Four, name some things that a scene must do. And there's a list. So remember, let's say if the list is five things, you give me one, you're not getting as many points as the person that gives three or even two. And if you give me more, you get more points, right? And that's especially important on the test. The homework is not that important. I'll just mark that you did it. But the percentages on the on the test, if I ask that question, might get you from a B to a B minus or a C plus. If you don't, or might jump you up from a C C plus to a B. Okay, or an A. What is exposition? So, give me. There's a nice quick short definition there in the work. So just let me know what is exposition, okay? All right. I think we move on or are we done for the day? Oh, the poet and language questions. Oh dear, oh Mona, okay. Here we go with the poetic language questions. One, explain denotation and connotation. So we went over that quite uh, in-depthly. So you should have information there. Two, how is the sound of a word important to poetry? So please don't give me a silly answer. Like, well, if you yell, it's a loud one. And if you whisper, it's a soft one. That's not what I'm looking for, okay? The answer is there or answers are there. Three, English depends on word order for what? Specifically for what? Okay. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Four, how will figures of speech help your poetry? So tell me how they help it. And uh, five, what tool can you use to underscore the poem's dominant purpose? So I might get a student saying, what do you mean by underscore? Why are you using that word in a dominant? Because the answer uses it. If I, I try to help you as much as I can, so if you can find this, then this will be connected and you'll easily have the answer. Right? I could use a different kind of adjective to make it harder, but doing this to assist you in finding the information in case you don't remember it up the top of your head. Okay, so I think that's it for today's lesson. All right, let me hit the stop share. I should come back. Oh, I came back. All right. So we're done. Again, this lesson is for November the 14th, week six, tomorrow, whisper, whisper. And uh, take care, everyone. And uh, I shall see you the week after. Okay. Thank you.